We can start the session, the real session in the program, in the written program. You can see that the first presentation would have been by Mario Neva, who is part of the IAS community, but unfortunately he was not able to come. But uh, we welcome here Daniela Jelencic, and she wrote a very interesting book. And uh, she's going to speak uh, with the same title uh, about uh, innovation in culture uh, development. And she formed an interesting word, culture inno, and she's going to analyze this effect in public policy. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thanks for inviting me. I know it's really difficult to gather people after lunch, including myself. I thought I was, going to, I was going to be late, but I wasn't, obviously. So I work uh, in the Institute for Development and International Relations, and I'm coming from Zagreb, Croatia. I work with the cultural department. And uh, I was a scholar here two years ago, and I'm really grateful for this opportunity. And I suppose I will um, somehow give this back. <laughs> By, uh, because the results uh, of this uh, uh, scholarship I was awarded uh, are actually gathered in this book. So I am going to be the replacement for Mario Neve, and uh, I'm only the replacement, but I hope I won't, uh, I won't uh, disappoint you with you this. The solution. Oh, the solution <laughs> of the pro. Thank you very much. So this is the book which has been published by uh, Palgrave Macmillan. Um, I'm really happy about it, and it deals with innovations in culture. What does it mean? I will explain a little bit later. So, obviously, this uh, conference today is uh, dedicated to innovation. So, innovation is definitely the buzzword of today's society. It's all over European Union, uh, all global uh, international uh, organizations and stuff like that. So, when we talk about business, as we did in the morning session, no wonder we're talking about innovation. But I will ask you truly, how many of you believe that culture can be the driver of development? So can you raise your hands? Truly. Hmm? Okay, quite a lot of people. Maybe I should rephrase the question. If you had to invest your own money in a company uh, coming from the field of culture, or the one like Barilla, for example, which one would you invest? Would you invest in culture? Mm -hmm. Quite a lot of people. I'm amazed. I'm amazed. So for all of you who are still not sure, and I probably did not persuade you, I would just like to show you this short video. Did it start? It starts with a sardine and a scandal. This is Silver. I am Silver. In 2003, Silver designers were assigned to develop the new symbol for the City of Lisbon festivities. While taking a walk in the market, Silver bought some sardines and scandal. In high contrast. And the sardine was born. It was a ready-made. It was pop art. In 2004, the Euro came to Portugal, the sardine joined the party. But we lost the final. 2005, sardine goes urban, jumps into paint cans and joins the stencil revolution. 2006, sardines are all over, streets, coffee shops, streetcars and even TV. Some sardines get stolen and appear online to the highest bidder. 2007, sardine goes green and gets recycled as cases and bags. 2008, the sardine goes multicultural, representing Africa, South America, Japan, Spain, Russia. 2009, designers and illustrators are invited to author their own sardine. 2010, the sardine celebrates 100 years of the Republic by going red and green. New talents are invited to draw. Sardine goes gorilla and appears all over the city. 2011, as the sardine gains momentum, Asiac sees an opportunity to take it to the next level and challenges all citizens to the creative process. A public contest is open. Everyone gets the chance to design their own sardine. 2,080 entries were received. 2012, 3,526 entries. A sardine exhibition opens in a downtown gallery. 
It was quite successful. More than 28,000 visitors. Historical fun fact. Beneath the exhibition floor existed ancient Roman fish tanks used to preserve sardines. 2013 marks the 10th anniversary of the sardine and massive participation continues, ranging from a seven-month-old baby to a 93-year-old. 6,446 entries from 44 countries. From the 10 winning sardines, three speak Japanese, Spanish and Italian. The exhibition opens up under the title The Sardine is for Everyone. Different products are created. Bags, pencils, cups, phone covers. There is even a police sardine. 2014, 8,258 entries from 59 countries, 1,202 different locations around the world re-imaging a sardine. The sardine turns into a brand called Sardine. 2015, the sardine can be anything. The contest opens with the motto, My life is a sardine. 2016, the largest number of entries ever received. 8,897 from 70 countries. The sardine came a long way. For more than 10 years, the sardine evolved into all kinds of forms, becoming synonymous with Lisbon and projecting the sardine as a global icon. no que diz respeito à sardinha, transformou a sardinha num símbolo, digamos, não oficial de Lisboa. Santos Pessoais, cerveja, festa... A sardinha assada no pão, a cair o boio e eu a comer aquilo tão bom. Festa? Ou seja, uniformizou a sardinha e hoje a sardinha não é da Ijaiac, a sardinha é de todos. Ou seja, foi o maior serviço que a Ijaiac prestou esta cidade, foi transformar a sardinha e a Lisboa numa, numa cidade moderna e tornar a sardinha visível para todos e hoje é um foco de turismo de rentabilidade para toda esta cidade de Lisboa. Viva a sardinha! Pessoas, rua... A sardinha é linda, é linda do Borreiro. Quando está assada só pode ser comer. Que é a criatividade, a criatividade dos jovens artistas, pá, que, 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 que são criativos e que tornam uma sardinha uma coisa banal e obras de arte. Pá, é isso, criatividade, essencialmente tudo a criatividade. Colorful, um, creative e cute. Animação. Uh... Não, andei um estrangeiro, um queria-me comparar numa sardinha. E mais, não tenho nada mais nada para dizer, meus caros. Hey, anyone else who is convinced that culture can be the driver of development? Yeah? Okay. So, culture and arts are increasingly important in the context of local development strategies. Here in this video, maybe uh, it's not about innovation, it's more about creativity, which people often are not sure, they're not sure what it, it they think it's the same, which is not. But still, EGEAC, which was mentioned here, may be considered an innovative process, an organizational innovation, because it's the private company which was created by the city of Lisbon in order to lead the development of the city through culture. And I hope you're convinced that culture really works in that uh, sense. So having all this in mind, I have decided to uh, research uh, innovations in culture, which are really rarely researched. We have heard today uh, during the book launch that people are talking about social innovation, uh, some other types of innovation, but hardly ever someone considers innovations in culture, and I wanted to focus on that. In Croatia lately, People are only talking about STEM policies, you know, like mathematics, technology, and stuff like that. Well, I wanted to uh, um, prove somehow that innovations can drive the development. If they are researched, they are practically always linked only to economy and urban development, whereas my book showed that they can lead de uh, development either in health or in transport or any kind of uh, uh, field. So the aim of the study was to prove the efficiency of innovations in culture in the general development, or at least in solve the small-scale problems which societies face. Uh, I'm going to give you a brief overview of the book which I, which I made, and um, maybe later we can discuss it if you are interested in a specific topic. So the methodology which I used was to first analyze the theoretical as well as practical policy frameworks 
complemented with practical examples. And I uh, coined this term Culturino effect, which actually refers to uh, innovations stemming from the uh, field of culture which drive the development. So the chapter one is dedicated to the power of culture in general development. I'm not going to focus on that, just to see that it uh, uh, tries to differentiate the concepts of culture and development as well as cultural development. Chapter two uh, goes, um, somehow uh, gives uh, um, the background of the study and uh, says that uh, the economical crisis which is visible today uh, calls for a change. It, it is based on the work of um, Paul Ray and Sherry Ruth Anderson, um, uh, who, I don't know if you heard about their book, How 50 Million People Changed the World, yeah? So they uh, defined the class, let's say, of cultural creatives. And uh, they say that uh, unemployment issues such as precarious work, uh, all other problems like health systems, energy provision, and stuff like that, they all drive this uh, crucial term of innovation. So the new economy actually is all about transmodernity. There is a social change in general, and uh, they, they see the uh, new economics uh, which, is going, uh, which is rising, it's the so-called empathy or compassionate economics, and they talk about this social term, which in the end uh, results with the purpose of creating a better society. Hmm? So it might seem a little bit naive and ideological, but it's really what, what's it all about today. Uh, it calls for sustainable economy, where the key word is social innovation. And here I wanted to uh, put uh, innovations in culture, uh, which are part of social uh, innovation. Uh, in the chapter three, I analyze uh, some basic concepts, which I'm not going to define here today because you all know about them, such as innovations, inventions, creativity, social innovation. Although sometimes I, I um, deliberately wanted to define this because in practice people um, very much um, confuse these terms. Hmm? So just for this uh, conference, I will define innovations in culture as innovation generated by the cultural sector, which advance development in general. In chapter four, I focused on public policies and innovations. So I analyzed theoretical, uh, theoretical cultural policy models. Uh, those who are from the field of culture, I believe that they know what the theoretical cultural policies frameworks are. There are different uh, uh, models, uh, such as the facilitator the state model, patron state model, architect, and so on and so on. I'm going back. So according to these models, I chose concrete countries, which are Croatia, Cuba, Finland, in alphabetical order, France, Latvia, Switzerland, United Kingdom, and United States of America, in order to analyze if, if any of these theoretical models, um, uh, by default, I would say, um, stimulates innovation. Hmm? Uh, and then I analyzed their practical um, outputs. Okay. <laughs> uh, and the results were, well, I would say mixed. So uh, just to put it in one sentence, some countries like the UK, Switzerland, and the USA clearly foster innovations and the so-called integrated development, which I will explain a little bit later, such as Finland, UK, and the USA. Whereas the UK cultural policy model uh, clearly fosters innovations, but mainly targeted towards economy and uh, economy only. I don't know if you guys know about their new branding strategy, which is called GREAT just great, like Great Britain, uh, it's all about economy. So they use culture only to, to make money, hmm? which is okay, which is uh, legitimate. But uh, I wanted to show that culture is much, much more than, than economy. The fifth chapter 
focuses on concrete examples uh, from practice. So I'm not going to uh, show you all of the uh, examples I, I analyzed, but just to back the theoretical research, I uh, chose uh, different cultural uh, fields, such as architecture, design, music, theater, and so on, uh, and uh, tried to find the examples from these fields which foster uh, innovations for development uh, globally. So the uh, examples are not focusing on any of these mentioned uh, countries, but globally. So you probably know about the piano staircase uh, in Sweden. It's the exit from the Stockholm uh, subway, actually. Uh, what was the problem? The problem was, which they wanted to solve, uh, the lack of movement of people and the obesity. Mm -hmm. So they engaged artists uh, to build stairs, like a normal staircase, which uh, is actually a piano. And it really um, uh, plays music when you step on them. So I don't have the video now, but you can also uh, always see it in the YouTube. When people step on it, it really uh, uh, plays music. Oh, you, you know about that. Excellent, excellent. Okay. The next one is the Cebu dancing inmates in the Philippines. It's actually a prison. And in order to uh, solve the problem of constant fights among uh, prisoners, uh, they uh, engage them in the dancing class. And they, uh, so this is actually, there, there is a, so, the whole uh, line of research in how dance can help in, some, in solving some psychological issues. Hmm? So they uh, performed the Michael Jackson thriller, this, uh, from this photo. The guy who you're seeing at the front is actually a guy, but he's playing a female role. Yeah, and he became the YouTube star, and he has so many clicks now. And this has been proven to decrease the rate of uh, crime, like, I don't know how many, I don't know the percentage, but it's really good. The next example is the project Travel by Book in Romania, where uh, actually the mayor of uh, Bucharest offered a free ticket to anyone who's using the subway uh, um, uh, and reading. Why? The problem was the high rate of illiteracy in Romania, and they wanted to solve that uh, problem and also uh, open the digital library at Victoria Metro Station in Bucharest. So when you came, uh, you could use your um, mobile phone and uh, download the book and, and read while you were riding the, the um, subway. The Pachuca paints itself is another project uh, in Mexico, whereas uh, the first photo you see uh, the Pachuca city, which has normally been um, white, uh, and they engaged local people, local community to paint it. What did they solve? What problem did they solve with, with this activity? Uh, people did not know each other. There was a huge unemployment rate and uh, again, street fights and stuff like that. So when they uh, had to paint the city, they uh, realized uh, that uh, they can do something of public value together. Hmm? And then one of them knew someone else, or he knew someone else, and it slowly leads to employment of these people, so they uh, now did not uh, street fight, uh, but started to work somewhere. Plus, it gave this aesthetical vision of the, uh, the city. Um, I think Stefano mentioned H&M uh, today in the morning. I also have uh, um, an example of H&M in my book, which actually, I don't know if you knew that the textile industry uh, uh, is a great uh, producer of pollution. It's very difficult to recycle uh, textiles, the unused textiles, like, because it makes huge pollution. So probably in all of your countries you have seen um, this uh, action which H&M offers is to bring your old clothes 
uh, at the cash desk, you give the old clothes there and they will recycle it and they give you a coupon for 15% off of your next purchase. Hmm? So there are different examples, either from business, uh, NGO sector, public sector, which I use in, in this book, but I chose only a few of them to present today. The next chapter uh, offers the conclusions of this public policy analysis plus some policy recommendations. So it was actually intended for policy makers and uh, I wanted somehow to give them a kind of uh, a direction which, which measures to introduce as to foster development coming from the field of culture. Uh, maybe one of the interesting uh, research results is that uh, innovations are irrespective of the structural forms and can happen anywhere. When I analyze Cuba, for example, in theory, Cuban uh, theoretical cultural policy model is the one which was copied from the uh, former USSR and which normally does not foster innovation at all. It's very closed, it's conservative. But so many innovations uh, happen in Cuba uh, because uh, the system is so closed. So people had to innovate, you know, just uh, they come up with uh, innovations that would normally be uh, stupid, but they're effective. They're efficient and effective, you know, either with uh, American cars, which they use for years, or they even did the innovation in music policy because they said that Cuban mu music is uh, too repetitive. So they formed a commission, you know, to introduce new elements in, the, uh, in Cuban music. So what changes are needed on the policy level or preferred, I would say? First of all, to put innovations in practice through the existing governance mechanisms, which would mean integration of innovations into the existing policy, or to try to transform the existing government mechanisms. And here I call for a collaborative, integrating network governance. What does it mean? It means that um, such a structural change uh, would um, Try to find the solutions from, uh, for the problems, not from different parallel sectors, but they would put the problem on the table and uh, administration from the urban policy department, cultural policy department, economy, uh, culture, they all sit together and they come up with a solution. So in practice, what does it mean? When you put out the call for um, putting, let's say, the new benches in the park, in the local park, then you call people from the field of design, but also help uh, sector uh, urban development economy, and they came up, come up with the solution. In culture, in cultural policies, also some changes are preferred, like the implementation of specific cultural programs which can introduce innovative policies, or then again to integrate culture into existing policies, but I uh, prefer the third approach, as I said, which I call integrated government. Today, you can see some examples of integrated govern, gov, uh, governance, actually, in the United States and uh, in Finland. They already uh, apply some of these uh, um, approaches, but it's still not like widespread. And the last chapter is what have we learned and where do we go from here? So the conclusion is that the culture is a growth factor and uh, it deserves a proper place within public policy system. I believe that's the case in Hungary because it's also in Croatia. Culture is always perce perceived as a fiscal burden actually and not the driver of development, which I wanted to change with this. And uh, what we should keep in mind is that innovations in culture do have instrumental value, which means they can help the economy, urban policies, industrial policies, but we should also think about culture and its intrinsic values, because culture means something to the society. And innovations are likely to happen in a diverse uh, environment, 
So I call for introduction of new policies aiming at generating innovations in culture, therefore for new specific programs, and the integrations of innovations in culture into existing policies plus the systemic change. So what should it look to today in cultural policies? I uh, call it culturization process of public policies. Uh, you can read all of this. Uh, I'm not naive and uh, saying that it will happen like this. Resistance is to be expected. To tell you the truth, I, own, uh, I had the opportunity, I was coordinating a UNESCO a International Fund for Cultural Diversity project for the city of Zagreb, where I already tried to introduce such policies but the administration is so very limited, you know, they only look at their own drawers and they didn't want that. So the resistance is to be ex except, expected, sorry, but that's the way innovations work, right? So my conclusion is that I truly believe that progress can happen only if one is brave enough to, uh, and willing to innovate, and I'm asking you, are you? Yeah. Thank you. We continue with another very interesting and challenging um, presentation, and we go back uh, more than 100 years. I would like to uh, thank uh, the organizers uh, for this invitation that helped me to rethink my ideas regarding identity in terms of architecture and the city. Um, it is not that innovative as uh, the lecture before mine and not as fascinating as the sardines uh, have been, but that's it. Um, I would have to be the first and the sardines uh, coming next. Um, history and research history. Um, identity was not that discussed about before the 19th century because the 19th century brought about all the social um, um, changes, restructuring the society, restructuring the whole globe, as we, we knew it from before, that brought about the need to define ourselves, our identity. Now, research history, there were two uh, seminal books uh, regarding uh, identity in architecture. The first is um, the Architecture der Donau Monarchie, uh, wrote, written by Akos Moravansky, um, who analyzed um, ethnic identities vis-a-vis -vis the city in Austria-Hungary. It is um, a very good task because Austria-Hungary has had a lot of identities. Um, he just had to connect uh, the ideas, the, the social background, psychology, with the actual uh, buildings uh, built uh, of stone and brick. Now, this book dealt with single buildings. It was published in the late 80s. Roughly 10, 15 years later, uh, Frederic Bedoir, um, Swedish researcher of uh, French origin, uh, tried to transfer this idea to the city as a whole. And he uh, published the book, The Jewish Contribution to Modern Architecture, um, which strictly fits into this framework he discusses only one ethnic group, the Jews, in a major European cities, including Budapest, including New York, uh, including Oradea, including uh, Timisoara. So um, he observed how this ethnic group, the Jews, tried to ex express themselves in urban terms. Uh, whether they applied a special language of architecture, whether they had a special behavior in the maze of the city. Uh, and he discovered that uh, we were working together that uh, Jews love to buy uh, houses on the crossings, uh, corner plots, uh, because of the shops, because of the identity, because of the way um, that they presented themselves uh, to the majority population. Uh, this is a bit of history. Uh, it is first the denominational map of Austria-Hungary. Uh, basically from um, uh, the southwest and west and the empire was, was Catholic. Uh, from the east, it was increasingly orthodox, uh, represented by uh, the Balkans and represented by, uh, by Russia, in a wider sense of the word. 
And of course, um, it was also the Protestant uh, influence which was more insular. As the Germans tried to uh, settle around the Danube, many Protestants settled inside Hungary, what is today Vojvodina, they were German cities, and so on and so forth. And there is also the idea of Islam. Uh, we think that it is a, a 21st century expansion, not really. In the 19th century, we have this uh, problem in Bosnia uh, that peaked um, in the later history of the region. Uh, besides denominational variety, there was the ethnic diversity of the empire. It's interesting how different ethnic groups and political groups uh, presented this issue. Uh, first, you have an official Hungarian map, which tries to emphasize uh, the insularity of some ethnic groups, while the Romanian map, it is uh, uh, the evening before um, the World War I uh, broke out in the eve, yeah. Um, the Romanians represented Bosnia as a homogeneous mass just to show that the Hungarian territories are narrower than uh, it is represented in the other map, while both maps were correct. Um, it is an issue after uh, Trianon in uh, 1920, Trianon Treaty, that uh, there were representations that the Romanian territories were represented as homogeneously one color with uh, the insule of, of Hungarians and Germans. Now, um, Count Teleki uh, tried to represent it in a better way. Non-inhabited uh, territories are painted white. Romanians are the pink and the Hungarians are red, which shows that roughly if we observe the inherit inhabited territories, then they are almost 50-50. While another map that just takes the cities and the densely populated areas gives another impression of ethnicity. Uh, I'm not here to debate whether this uh, treaty was uh, righteous or not, or just or not, but the point is that there was an ethnic tension, and ethnic tension became a uh, driving force uh, behind the art and architecture. Uh, we have two pairs of circles. On the left-hand side, we have the organic society, which builds an organic city. We have seen this uh, city that was later painted and this was the way how to solve um, street violence. Um, in an organic society, there is no violence. There is no idea of identity. Everybody is part of an organic uh, system. Um, he as a person, his building as a, as a built entity in the urban um, fabric, and there are no discussions about that. Modernization changed that, and uh, identity split into different sub-identities. I grew up in Vojvodina and I was um, a Hungarian speaking uh, Vojvodina Jew in Yugoslavia. It was uh, quite a complex uh, issue and I belonged to all this group and I felt uh, obliged to represent all these groups of my uh, identity uh, fragments. Now these fragments show up in the built environment. Uh, different ethnicities favored in the empire different architectural styles we know the Hungarian Lard Nouveau. We know um, the Polish uh, Witkiewicz style that we, I will linger on each of them uh, very uh, shortly. What happened at the same time, it was not only the single building, it was also the city that uh, suffered, in quotation marks, changes. And it was Hans Edelmeier who wrote the famous book Verlust der Mitte, uh, which spoke about the city losing the center and the example is, I'm losing the mouse, the example is Vienna. Uh, before modernity, there were two powers of center, the palace and the church. And they built up the Mitte, the old city, that radiated towards the whole empire. Vienna was really the trendsetter of what was going on in the empire, save in the 19th century when um, outside forces started to challenge this monolithic uh, identity. Now, what happened in the 19th century, the Vienna uh, Riechstrasse was uh, constructed, which was built on the glacis, on this uh, free space that served different purposes. You know that around each fortress you have to have a, an open space to kill the enemy when he is approaching uh, um, uh, your fortress. Now, this uh, was left empty uh, until the second part of the 19th century, uh, 
it was not that much an, an invasion from the outside. It was a social tension brewing in the early capitalist societies that necessitated these uh, security arrangements. Anyhow, um, after the revolutions, it became redundant, and there was a big project to build this wide, empty area. And this was uh, the exemplification of losing the center. So there were new centers, center of political power on the level of the empire. This is the parliament. Uh, center of power on the level of the uh, city, uh, das Rathaus. Uh, then you have the center of uh, culture, um, the Burgtheater. Uh, it was the first German-speaking uh, theater in Europe, in Vienna, in the, in the 19th century, much before uh, Berlin. Berlin has this inferiority complex towards Vienna. Then you have, uh, uh, sorry if there are uh, Austrians sitting, uh, or, or Berliners sitting here. And then you have the, the Staatsoper, previously it was the Hofoper, it is here. And then you have, of course, the museum as an identity uh, building element of the city, which was always, in a way, ancient. And with that, the static center, before, as uh, defined by uh, Selmayr, became a billboard of different uh, identities, political, cultural, and also ethnic. Here we have the Ringstrasse, uh, which is basically an urban fabric with a neo-Renaissance liberal uh, uh, identity. The uh, entrepreneurs, uh, newly uh, um, established barons who bought the title with, the, with their money, and it was not the previous uh, organic uh, feudal society. What is interesting, in this context, uh, you get different architectural styles, and it is an expression of different social and ethnic identities. Uh, first of all, the Burgtheater is a Hochburg, as the Germans say, of uh, liberalism uh, and the liberal arts. It is, uh, it is a theater, and it uses uh, Renaissance. Renaissance as an expression of the, the onset of, of modernity. Now you have the German part, the ethnic part of the business. And um, Austria was always afraid of any ethnic uh, uh, identity. Nevertheless, uh, there was a strong current in Vienna uh, represented by architect Friedrich Schmidt, who built uh, the city hall, who built the uh, Votivkirche, and who was active also in the uh, Christian Socialist Party, which was, which was in a way ethnic, more inclined to the German masses, while the liberals were um, more inclined to the Jewish middle classes. Um, here you have uh, the identity of the Gothic, the German, the Germanic, and the city hall and the Votivkirche. Here you have the Votivkirche, which is Gothic. Gothic is the German art. Uh, never mind that the Gothic is actually French art, but it was adopted by the Germans, and now it figures, you know, as the properly German. Vis-a-vis -vis these other identities, uh, neoclassicism, which is, uh, which is very liberal, cosmopolitan, based on the Greek or Roman antiquity, represented by the Musikverein, um, the Academy of Angewandte Kunst, and the apex is definitely the Staatsoper, previously Hofoper, which was a mix of, of uh, uh, neo-Renaissance and uh, neo-Baroque. Neo-Baroque is also conveying the idea of the Catholic identity as the architectural style of counter-reformation. What happened in Prague uh, was a different issue of identity. Uh, Czech architecture, particularly Prague architecture, started to deal with identity very late at the beginning of 20th century, where the empire was, when the empire was around to fall apart, and they tried to, to uh, figure out what would be their identity. Here you have a house built by Josef Hochol in the spirit of uh, Czech cubism, which takes into consideration uh, local identity. Prague is very strong in Gothic, very strong in Baroque, so the plastic facade three-dimensional facade is the expression of uh, this identity. Probably the most explicit building of this type, which carries Baroque and Gothic elements and also carries elements of modernity, the steel beams over the windows. At the same time, it has the Guckfenster, which is a, a local tradition, is the Ucerne Matki Borgi. It's a coffee shop. Uh, you probably know the building very well. And it integrates also, uh, it is about the Black Madonna, 
on its facade in a baroque manner takes this additional layer of past in order to legitimate uh, such a modernistic approach. It's an extremely modern house. It has 50% uh, of the facade is glass. Can you imagine in this period uh, in Austria-Hungary it is really uh, groundbreaking. Another identity uh, in Prague, uh, it was the former uh, Jewish quarter, the Josef of the ghetto, uh, which started to be exist in the 11th century. And by the end of the 19th century, local Jews uh, decided to, to demolish on the pretext of hygiene and modernity and so on and so forth, uh, demolish the whole quarter, just uh, retain some synagogues. It is the oldest uh, functioning synagogue in Europe, the Atnaschul. And what is interesting, this new freestyle architecture copied the local identity from these uh, synagogues that uh, survived. Budapest. Uh, Budapest was really an ethnic mix. Today, nobody thinks of Budapest as divided into roughly four quarters of Hungarian, German, Slavonic, and Jewish. Um, Jewish was basically uh, the old Jewish quarter and the new Jewish quarter. But uh, the most important avenue, Andrashi Ut, was owned uh, basically by uh, Jewish landowners and developers. It is a research of my colleague, uh, Frederic Bedoar, who uh, analyzed the periods of, of the uh, Andrashi Ut, which is in a way a counterpart of the Viennese Ringstrasse, but architecturally more compact because it's an avenue and it's not a ring which is broken in each uh, tram stop. It, it, it is a, it's, it's, it's not a... Um, so clear urban statement. It's a sort of Siegesallee. If you know Siegesallee in Berlin, this is a, 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 a petit version of, of the Siegesallee. And my colleague Bedoar analyzed the house ownership and the liberal Jews. Liberal Jews are painted with black, Hungarians are painted with white, and gray are the public buildings, uh, the railway insurance company and the Budapest uh, State Opera. Uh, this identity, this liberal identity, uh, calls for, again, neo-Renaissance, but a very special uh, neo-Renaissance uh, which is a bit more decorated and less restrained than uh, other uh, types of the Renaissance with clear references to the sources of European culture, Greek or Roman antiquity, Vulcanus, and the biblical. Um, and the biblical is uh, Moses is, is uh, carrying the tablets of the law. The Poles. Um, ethnic uh, started to emerge in the empire by the end of the 19th century when wider social classes, uh, already some parts of peasantry, and um, became literate. And this literacy brought about the rehabilitation of the vernacular. Vernacular was swept under the corner. Uh, apart from some romantic buildings, vernacular was limited to the villages and small towns. Um, the game started to change by the end of the 19th century. It was the first one who did that, was uh, Stanislav Witzkiewicz, who uh, started to integrate um, vernacular of the place, uh, five minutes, and this vernacular meant that he started building bourgeois habitat in vernacular details. So basically the space, it is the Villa Koliba, the same name Koliba is, is a hut, uh, shows that it was a vernacular intention, but the spaces and the volumes are bourgeois. So it's a chalet which got a layer of national uh, Polish identity going so far that you have the peasant's culture, it's a priest represented, the Catholic priest in a vernacular manner, it's in the Villa Koliba, it's a brand new slides of some 15 days, uh, taken 15 days ago. Then vernacular identities in Hungary. In Hungary, vernacular identity uh, was part of the Hungarian Art Nouveau, but it was more vernacular than Art Nouveau in the French sense of the word. And I'm going to present shortly the city hall in Subotica, uh, which was uh, designed first in neo-baroque in order to get a building permit. And then the architects change it to a national uh, idiom, so-called national idiom, supposed national idiom, which was, which was not national, it was just vernacular. And with this vernacular, they solved a huge task. It is an unbelievably big building, one of the biggest city halls. It is the size of the Rathaus in Vienna. And uh, the city had uh, 80,000 inhabitants. 
So this is a huge disparity building a monument of this um, ethnic um, identity, which took all these fancy elements of um, the staircase, a big uh, baroque staircase, and parallel to this um, architectural historic uh, discourse, you have in the detail the vernacular. So in a way, it's a parallel discourse, an integration of the vernacular into the national, which became a sort of spine of the national, particularly in nations that didn't have national independence until uh, yesterday. This is, for instance, the tax authorities uh, corridor, where the peasants came to pay for uh, taxes, and they found all their folklore on the walls just to be dazzled and, and pay more easily. Then there is another layer, a layer of Freemasonry. Uh, it's unbelievable that the architects, all of the city, the elite, was a, a member of the lodge. They were Freemasons, and they uh, made the glowing star 12 copies on the building and even wanted on the tower to have a glowing, glowing star. And then the archbishop said, said, no, 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 it's going to be a cross. And then this um, idiom spread uh, to the whole city and this uh, national folklore, Art Nouveau, became the name of the game in the first decade of the 20th century. Sorry for being uh, a minutes longer. Yeah, here you have my website and you can download a couple of these articles and even books. Thank you very much for this very impressive presentation. We enter into the world of ecological urbanism by uh, Daniel Escarillas, who is going to show what we can learn from LA, California. I would like to thank Ayask, and it's my first visit to Hungary and Kosek, and I'm very happy to, to see this little bit part of your country, and I hope to get to Budapest that after last uh, uh, presentation, I am very willing to, to see the architecture, and I also thank the president, the panelists, for the very brilliant presentation about the architecture. And I am going to speak about a very fragmented city, which is Los Angeles in California. So I, I think the fragmentation is definitely a characteristic of our regional and local uh, context. And it's been like this probably for 100 years, but before I would like to say where I come from and who I am, um, I am an architect that is interested into cities and also economics. And I come from a university in Madrid, which is a private university. It's called the Camilo José Cela University, where we have this city follower uh, group, research group. And we are uh, changing, like this are our small publications about what is city followers. And it's a, a part of uh, what we try to do with an architecture school that is turning into an urban studies school and that is starting to become an interdisciplinary approach to the city rather than a planning, urban design or just architecture approach. So this is probably the reason why I'm here and into this Creative Cities Conference as a person from a different research institute that I asked where we also think, as you do, that it must be a very interdisciplinary and holistic way to combine the understanding of our regional and local reality in cities. So uh, once we have uh, spoken a little bit about this, myself, um, I did a PhD into American studies, that's why I'm going to speak to you about Los Angeles, and I published this book about how uh, modern California houses represented a post-war ideal of domesticity that was connected to the postmodernism uh, psychological and the consumption society model and how it was very uh, created by a lot of uh, European exiles and immigrants into California and some other aspects and went back into Europe in the 1980s and, and beyond and right now could be understood uh, California as a lab also for many other things, but it started as a lab also for housing. It's uh, been noted before that it's a place where we can find at Silicon Valley all the startups, and before we had the movies, and we have lots of things happening there. And it's definitely, or I think, of the places I've visited, 
uh, one of the most innovative ones or, or one that is definitely a driver for innovation. Uh, in Madrid, I have been uh, doing research into cities. That's another book I've edited about urban strategies for social and spatial reformulation. I believe that uh, in the way cities are more unequal and fragmented, it is very important to go back to the spatial dimension of social issues so that we don't forget that the way we design the planning affects a lot of how then resources are allocated and how then people's lives go. So I would like to exemplarize a little bit in this uh, very quick conference about Los Angeles, uh, why it is a very exceptional place, but at the same time it's a place that could be an example for us to see a little bit our future in terms of regional and local development. So first we are going to speak a little bit about the context of why Los Angeles and this term of ecology in Los Angeles comes from a British historian, Brainerd Barham, and then we will say a little bit about him. And then which are the ecologies he, he found in LA and he was the first author to talk about ecology into a city, like in the way we understand it from the urban and architectural point of view. And Finally, we're going to focus into the conclusions about the sustainability of Los Angeles, and which are not extremely nice conclusions. Uh, Los Angeles is a huge uh, region. Uh, in this image, we see that it follows the ocean, uh, but it's not as flat as it looks like. It has several hills surrounding it of over 15 million inhabitants. So it is both local and regional, and uh, it is one of the first places that was designed as a multi-centered urban, uh, cent I mean, urban city or, or urban region. It was one of the first times that it was not, and if you have to ask someone what is the center of Los Angeles, you will have several options. For some people, it would be Santa Monica, Venice by the beach, for some others, the downtown, for some others, Hollywood where you have the sign. So that is really impossible to do in Europe. Even in London, which is maybe the more decentralized place in all Europe, there is a center. It's called the city. So it's a very specific thing that has a lot to do with the way we have now um, our cities in the rest of the world. Uh, this is a, a, a site from a book, a novel, The Day of the Locust where uh, Nathaniel West said, where else should they go but California, the land of sunshine and oranges? Then I would like to say that this uh, real estate basis, like the weather and the geography, are still fundamentals to any city. So when we speak about regional or local development, first of all is where you are and what the weather look like where you are. And it is very difficult to go artificial from these points. So first of all, there was a an explosion of uh, what would be the holiday makers, the early holiday makers. This is 1920s, bungalows at Pasadena. So it was first known uh, as a place where you could go on vacation because the weather was nice. Afterwards, it was the movies and the cinema industry who thought the same thing. It started in New York. But in New York, the weather was not the same as in California. And it was cheaper to be able to set your movies in the outside than having to rent a space. So that's why the first uh, movie industry moved from New York to California also. So the weather has a lot to do and, and attiring people. But it was also a communication center. And this is funny because it comes from the Spanish having uh, a colony over there in California that they settled up from Mexico, a series of roads that ran parallel the coast and had different ranch and fortifications and small churches. So Los Angeles starts at one of these places that was uh, the Church of uh, Santa Maria de Los Angeles, uh, the short name for Los Angeles. So at, at the end, being into a place where a lot of uh, crossroads happen is another key point into the regional uh, areas and, and local combined. Um, growth was at Los Angeles very fast. We can see here how they were able to set up acres and acres of houses in months. And it was the other element when you have the communication network to be able to make your city grow very fast. 
also there was an image of the city, as the president uh, speaker was noting, and also Los Angeles had their own image of the city, and they had such a lot of um, mainly Austrian and German exiles and famous uh, Austrian architects like Richard Neuter or Rudolf Schindler went there. And uh, also that created for the new, uh, uh, a lot of Jewish people also emigrated to LA in the 1930s. And all that money wanted to create a new uh, society, also with a new architecture. And this new architecture that was the image of, of Los Angeles was a, an old modern architecture. And it was uh, connected also to contemporary art and sculpture and painting, also what was happening right now in America. On the other hand, Rainer Banham was a British uh, historian uh, of art and architecture I was very critical uh, to tradition. Uh, when he wrote this theory and design in the first machine age, he came to say that uh, what was, a, was told as modern by very famous modern architects as Le Corbusier was not modern at all, that it had nothing to do with the machine and the possibilities of technology. So uh, this Rainer Bangham who designed himself into an environmental bubble started to be uh, very conscious of the possibilities of technologies to create atmospheres. Uh, he did four uh, radio programs for, for the British BBC at LA, that's how he got to LA, uh, where he described that very uh, strange to him uh, place that was Los Angeles. Actually, he was not able to drive, and when he went to LA, he had to learn to drive, because otherwise he could not even move because it was not possible, it is very difficult today, to be in Los Angeles with public transportation. which is pretty amazing at, at this moment of, of our lives. So he spoke about Encounter with Sunset Boulevard, the, this, the, the necessity of having to drive, then the roadscape with rusting rails, that it means that they were always into a traffic jump, because if everyone has to do the same, then the city is blocked. Beverly Hills to is a ghetto, talked about the fragmentation of society in LA, which is huge. And the art of doing your thing is a very Californian thing that meant that everyone could do whatever he or she wanted, as architecture, as the way they dressed, and everything else. He published this book, Los Angeles, the Architecture for Ecologies, in, in the 1970s, and it was the first time that ecology was used in, into the urban and architecture world to describe a city. He did then a documentary for the BBC where he was driving and filming and with this uh, true British uh, mentality of uh, going to further places and broadcasting them alive, no matter safaris and Los Angeles and whatever. So we're gonna dip a little bit into the ecologies which are Seferva, Foothills, The Plains of Feet, and Utopia. Basically, it's that you have the nature, the communications, the architecture, and the suburbs, like the four main elements of Los Angeles. Whether before, if an art historian had to go to a city, would say we have the center, we have the extension of the city, we have the countryside. This was the first time that it was designed, uh, or it was studied the city, as a grid, uh, different layers or grids that were juxta, in a juxtaposition. He thought that the ocean was definitely the first characteristic of Los Angeles, the possibility of going to the beach and doing surfing, which at the moment was a very uh, Californian thing. He also thought that the location, the fact that they had these uh, ranges of mountains plus the water fountains, was very important because without all that possibility of getting water that in Los Angeles can be even from 200 kilometers away, like there's a whole uh, construction of dams and canals that brings the water from the mountains which are close to Nevada into the city. Without that possibility, if for instance in Los Angeles water could have been possible, there would have been no Los Angeles. So it's very important when we talk about sustainability and ecology to realize which natural resources we are leaning into when we do urbanization. 
you can see here more or less how the water fills from the mountains, which is got from there into the valleys and to the to the different coasts of Los Angeles. In this 1946 city planning uh, drawing, which shows also to us that very early planning documents were available and that there was an early consciousness about the necessity of a regional planning. This was happening in the 1940s in LA that understood that it was not possible to make only a city center map or an area map, that it was necessary to have an overall vision of the resources and where we're coming and the communications. Um, there is also in, in Los Angeles uh, and in every other city in other way an utopian view of what it is Los Angeles. In Los Angeles, the utopian view is very uh, expressed by the movies when they want to, and there is this La La Land movie, pretty recent, what is Los Angeles for a movie? It's not something bad or something uncomfortable. It is something pretty uh, idyllic and, and very beautiful, like houses, vegetation, water, uh, a possibility of living outside, inside the house the whole year. This is the image that uh, Los Angeles created about uh, itself. It's also an element I wanted to remark because we are into this Creative Cities uh, also conference that it was an auto creation, more or less all California, but also Los Angeles. They created themselves and the, the vision they wanted others to have from themselves. Um, this again shows to us the water canals and, and the distribution from the mountains into the different dams and, and different water system of the city. And also how this uh, city is divided into communities and it is very fragmented and ever since was like this. And uh, every community settled up at a different part of the, of the area, of the area of Los Angeles. And there was a natural zoning by uh, the different uh, highness of your house. Like if you were living in the valleys, you had less money that if you were able to live upper in the mountains where you had better air, views of the ocean. So it was a vertical zoning and it was a, another horizontal zoning closer to the ocean versus the interior. It was a pretty complex zoning uh, mechanism that allocated the different communities or the different people resources throughout the area of Los Angeles. Um, the, the kind of houses uh, that for the wealthier people in Los Angeles were and that are pretty famous even right now in uh, also commercials for TV and, and different uh, movies and are still one of the best examples of domestic architecture in America and in, in the rest of the world from the 20th century also wanted to show this uh, ideal of how people live in Los Angeles and this transparency between the interior and the exterior, the use of the exterior spaces, a relaxed way of being, a transparent way of being was the opposite to a very European uh, or very um, um, hidden domesticity where we are inside our house like a castle, no one knows what's happening inside and it's like a mystery a little bit, it's the opposite here, it's like a very like uh, also happy way of being in, in that moment, this is the 1940s, 50s, 60s when, when I think um, that that's about to and at that time, in the 1940s, the Los Angeles Regional Agency started uh, thinking about people. And this is a, a book of 1942 by Mel Scott about cities are for people. And also, uh, this uh, shows to us that was an early attempt to think about the people living in Los Angeles at that moment that it was this endless growth that was not really controlled and there were people saying, okay, if you want to make all that uh, area of urbanization, you need to have a school, you need to have a grocery shop, you need to have some services. And this uh, general planning was established uh, so early as the 1940s. Uh, also, this uh, possibility of doing whatever architecture is a very Angelina thing. Uh, downtown had been pretty let's say for, forgotten ever since until uh, pretty recent 
Um, and it was not an important part of the city, but uh, when the real estate uh, bubble by Japanese companies buying lots of things in the United States in the 1990s rediscovered the possibility, now we have the uh, Walt Disney Auditorium, now we have uh, Moneos Cathedral, uh, we have lots of things in real estate, but at the moment of, of the book and before the 1990s, it was practically non-existent. <laughs> But uh, now it is pretty, it exists and it is a, a place of, of different kind of power than the one represented at Hollywood. Um, they uh, built a huge uh, network of freeways and highways. That was very important if you cannot move. And also there was an electric railroad that unfortunately uh, was taken away uh, in the early post-war. So even they had public transportation at the beginning, in the 1920s. Because otherwise, if you don't allow people to get to their homes and to move from their homes and their works, this doesn't work. So, uh, the, it's, so it's very, very important, I think, in this sustainable uh, development, we think about the kind of transportation that went into the motorized living in LA as also a sign of the city and an image of the city. So we're... Um, going to focus now into three uh, possible conclusions or hypothetical conclusions of all this. Uh, that I'm, I'm sorry if I'm out of time. Uh, I'm a little bit worried, so I'm gonna go very fast because the first one is the the idea of uh, how we depend into the resources and the air pollution. If we are into a motorized living what does represent uh, the oil or petrol as our blood in our city, in, in our system, that really penalizes a lot Los Angeles. Then it is the social minorities distribution and how the social fragmented, you see there are areas where more than 50% or more than one third of the population is from a different ethnicity than the major white ethnicity that the United States it was also the, the place where uh, very heavy and violent riots happened uh, at least three times in the last 50 years because of this, because of not that much the competition between the whites and the Hispanic or Afro-American, but between the minorities among themselves. And, and, it is, uh, and you see how transportation allows to very fast move from one area to the other going through the conflict areas without having to be there because you go at a different level. So also the transportation at fragmented uh, metropolis allows uh, you to move fast from one point to the other ignoring the existing situation. This was called by Peter Plagens, that was an art critic, The Ecology of Evil, uh, because uh, the truth is like when you visit Los Angeles, you lose a lot of time in a car, but a lot of time around the day. And it's the usual view of a highway is like this, like all cars going slowly, moving, but very slowly. So it, it speaks a lot about this environmental issue that we were talking before, or consciousness of the environment that we were talking before. And also this ethnicity and fragments have been defined by uh, um, an urban geographer, Mark Davis, as the ecology of fear where then the uh, more affluent neighborhoods have to be fortified and have to be blocked to the rest of the city and are private roads and are protected because uh, we, want, we are so wealthy and we are so close to areas which are not that like that and we, f we are fear of that and then we need to go into what some authors describe as a carcerization uh, environment. And, and there's a lot of this in LA, and there are uh, stories of police violence and a lot of other things that go combined with this. But I would like to have this image of Sunset Boulevard as the end to, re to remind you that it's still a place which has the image as a creative city to uh, uh, express herself or himself as an idyllic uh, California way of living and doing place, no matter what we said before. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Hilary Brown from the City University New York is going to speak about an exemplary town in it, and its bioregion, Oberlin, Ohio. My host for bringing me back to Kursig, so I've had the opportunity to reflect perhaps a little bit on, uh, on Kursig's issues. Um, and I will, you know, follow the extreme of Los Angeles with perhaps uh, a discussion of a city which is much more an exemplar of a small city uh, undergoing a kind of renaissance. And I, I actually have to thank Jody because you had asked me if there is an example of a city uh, that I could think of and I had to think. And then I thought about uh, something that I'm familiar with. And so as part of a disclaimer, I should say that I am a graduate of Oberlin College in Oberlin, Ohio. However, all of what I'm talking about happened many, many years later. So I, I want to um, speak about a project that I think um, is not known outside the US that really stands as an example of holistic thinking, of integrated thinking about a small creative city in a bioregion, uh, very much tied to uh, what might happen here in Kusik. Um, so I, I chose it for that reason. And, and what I'll describe is the leadership process and the organizational learning that happened uh, following the leadership of the institution and a particular individual to show how urban regions, small urban regions, as socioeconomic, uh, uh, socioecologic, uh, sorry, socioeconomic systems interact with their natural, uh, with, with natural systems. So I'd like to suggest that we're beginning to see small towns uh, manifesting an understanding of the impacts of climate instability and are beginning to ask questions about responding. And many uh, sociologists and political scientists have started to write articles about how local governments in small towns or even in large, lo large local governments like New York City are trying to respond to the uh, destabilized uh, situation from climate uh, climate change. And we, they're responding with voluntary transitions. And so I'm going to talk about one where this has taken place by a kind of local self-determination. Um, what, in this particular case, I'll talk about what is the role for a, a university uh, or, t or college that is situated in a small town to play in that process? Um, and how do they enjoin with the cities? Uh, 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 citizens and other players uh, to bring about that change. Um, so here, here we are in Kursig. Uh, as you see, we're situated in an agricultural bioregion. Uh, we've talked today about its cultural heritage and uh, its uh, seat as an academic center, not only for the IASC, but for other regional uh, colleges and undertaking the, the Creative City Project. So I just wanted to identify this with respect to uh, the city I'll talk about, which is more or less comparable in size, has a very similar uh, bioregion, very agricultural, uh, rather flat. Um, it is located in what's called the Rust Belt location of the Midwest, which is an area where decline of, of heavy industry has left the towns struggling for economic survival. Um, but more importantly, Oberlin also, in a way heroic like uh, Kusig, has a uh, history of uh, social activism. And uh, it was on the Underground Railroad, which was part of the network of uh, escape routes for slaves. Uh, aided by abolitionists to find their way to freedom. And so Oberlin was one of the stations on the so-called Underground Railway. And, in, and many people said that Oberlin uh, and its assistance of a particular slave started the Civil War. Um, so I want to, uh, yeah, it's just to underscore the population, more or less equivalent. It, its economy is more or less based around uh, the college. 
And in that way, it is better positioned than many of the small towns uh, which have no local economy. So to talk for a minute about the uh, local college, um, uh, it has, as I say, it's a rather interesting history. It was the first co-educational school. It was the first uh, school to admit African Americans uh, in the US. Um, it had a religious uh, history that uh, created that sense of tolerance and openness. And um, the college today is a small uh, institution. It has a uh, world-class conservatory. It has a uh, world-class art history, uh, art museum. Um, and it is uh, known as one of the liberal uh, progressive colleges. Um, and here you, you see the, uh, on the left the region of the college, the uh, joined to the town by a square. Um, and uh, I will be talking about how the initiative of the Oberlin Project was to work with the, the government and downtown of Oberlin uh, and to create many pilot projects, one of which is the Arts District, which is a sustainable, innovative economic uh, development. Uh, a, a word about the, uh, the architect behind this, uh, David Orr, um, who uh, I never knew but I uh, reached out to uh, when I became interested in sustainability. He's really one of the academic leaders in the nation uh, who talks about uh, environmental literacy. And he brings that very much to the experience of the students. Um, he is, uh, uh, you can see from some of his quotes, uh, he's very centered on citizen participation and engagement of the students in working with citizens for a transformation. I think that I could say uh, I wanted to organize my talk along these four different uh, trajectories uh, to talk about the role of the college and the faculty in terms of knowledge management of this transformation process. How through a series of reports, uh, working with uh, experts, think tanks, uh, and with government, they could identify uh, ways to transform, in many ways, the central issue, which is the energy system of the college. At the same time, they were transforming the educational uh, opportunities in the regions of secondary schools and uh, community colleges to embrace sustainability. So it was very broad brushed. I'll talk about some of their pilot projects, which are rather significant and have taken them uh, to a uh, world renown. Uh, I'll mention something about the Green Arts District because I think it has some relevance for what we have here in uh, Kusig. And then I'll talk about um, its relationship with the bioregion through its embrace of uh, agricultural transformation to promote uh, food localization. So on the, on the side of uh, knowledge management, from David Orr's uh, multiple books about environmental education, he really embraced uh, the students engaged in learning through doing, project-based learning. Uh, the first of his projects was um, building a new environmental studies center, but the students actually researched and acted as the clients in the design of the zero energy uh, building, so zero impact. But more importantly, the students were involved in operating some of the facilities. So they're they involved in something called a living system, which is using plants uh, to uh, eliminate the uh, organics and, and uh, particles from wastewater so that it could be reused in the system. So students very much engaged. Uh, they undertook internships with the local government to develop their climate action plan. Um, and so they learned many new skill sets besides their education. Uh, they learned about business. They learned about um, teamwork and management of, of, of groups and stakeholders. So the next step really was to start to uh, work with government and energy organizations, energy agencies to inform themselves how to move forward to improve energy efficiency and to move towards a zero carbon or a low carbon economy. And so they got grants from government uh, and they uh, 
in in uh, in this in the uh, in in the building sector, they worked uh, with the local buildings uh, to understand their operations, and the, they they challenged the students to develop a tool to monitor building performance of its energy use, uh, its lighting, its amount of water, and the students developed this tool on the right. Um, that is really a predecessor of many of today's environmental management tools. This was in 1989 or 1990, and uh, it was very successful, and the students then uh, were able to scale that up to the look at the town and the public buildings and the college buildings so that they could manage uh, all of the energy, water, and, uh, and carbon in the town. And that, of course, uh, the students then uh, created a company which was then acquired and sold and became a major player in this metrics of buildings area. Um, Orr and his uh, students and co-faculty worked very closely with the, um, uh, the town and they uh, undertook uh, using this uh, ICLEI five-step process, process which you may know um, to undertake reductions of their greenhouse gases. And they also brought this to the attention of the city utilities and partnered them into this. So they were not adversarial, but they were part of uh, this transformation. Um, this brought them to the attention of the uh, Clinton Foundation, which is working with cities such as uh, Tokyo and Shanghai, uh, Copenhagen, um, as the climate neutral cities around the world. And Oberlin is this big uh, compared to the 17 other cities, which are enormous, but it's an uh, exemplar in that, in that way. So one of the things the students engaged in was to take forward what would be the strategy, that having established a goal of 70% uh, reduction by 2015 of uh, carbon, uh, uh, carbon emissions, what would be the strategies, and they worked by setting up a council with the, the, uh, the town and the citizens of the town. Um, and they created this action plan, you'll see some of the outputs of that. And then the students went further and they investigated um, their own, they made their own contributions into a carbon fund that would then uh, invest in projects locally in carbon reduction. So tree planting, for example, or reducing fertilizer use. Um, one of the outcomes was the, the town and the college committing to 100% renewable electricity. They engaged a, a, a solar farm developer under something called a power purchase agreement where the college and town voluntarily decided to, to use solar energy. They created the farm uh, that was successful and then the town and college together said, well, we will no longer take any energy from coal fire power plants, but we will purchase hydropower and, and uh, wind power and other renewable sources. And that took them to a, a, about 50%. But then they looked around in the region and said, what is another source of potential energy? And they looked to their landfill, which, as you know, produces a methane gas. Uh, which can be, which is typically either uh, wasted or flared, but if it is harvested, it is a gas that can be used to generate energy. And that's what the city and uh, college did. And now they are at almost 90% renewable uh, electricity. So they were using uh, the waste resource as a source of fuel. Uh, they also went further in, in thinking about the region and the farms where uh, corn, uh, feed corn production for animals uh, is part of the uh, primary crops. Uh, there are many uh, animals and dairy farms and so on. So you could put together the waste from the manure of the animals, the waste of the animals coupled with the agricultural waste and put it into a tank and use an anaerobic digestion process, a passive process, to uh, create the gas, they harvest the gas, and they use that to generate energy, and that would serve the farms. 
it would reduce the waste and it would uh, reduce their carbon footprint. Uh, for many reasons, they found it was cost effective with a short payback, but there were many regulatory hurdles. Um, in other ways, the college impacted the thinking of local non-governmental organizations who were working with affordable housing, low-income housing, to reduce their energy losses. Um, and by um, in improving the insulation of the houses, uh, they began at the rate of 100 households a year. Uh, they are radically reducing the energy use of the town. Uh, they are doing projects such as building a passive solar energy home, which uses only solar energy to heat and cool the house. Uh, what, uh, what is most moving for me, since I'm a graduate of Oberlin and I carry some of the, the spirit in my heart of the, uh, of the uh, sort of uh, civic-based orientation, I'm going to talk about just two examples. One student who I knew um, afterwards became the city manager, sorry, became the uh, sustainability manager for the city of Chicago at age 28. He went on to become a deputy mayor uh, in uh, uh, Portland, and today he is the mayor or city manager of Vancouver and is running it from a sustainability perspective. So uh, from small acorns, big oaks grow. Um, these three students on the left, as a student project, looked at some of the regulatory, financial, uh, and other impediments to uh, building local affordable housing in the city. And they took that to the next step. They went out and raised the funds, they, they hired a developer, and they built a project which today is 40% uh, low income. And in this way, they transformed some of the economy of the town. So uh, these are just four students from uh, one year. So imagine how this scales up. Um, and then lastly, the, the Green Arts District, which was a vision of David Orr, saying we have to bring science and arts and humanities together in a transdisciplinary way, and we're going to build a sustainable zero energy uh, arts district um, where they now hold a convention, there's a hotel, uh, where it is a, a zero energy uh, use building and they bring people from all over the country to look at this exemplar. And this is just showing how they rely upon uh, natural ventilation, they use uh, green plants to improve the air quality and to, uh, re and to uh, treat the wastewater. And then finally, uh, David Orr was an advocate of local food for 20 years or more. And his vision was to work with farmers within a 10-mile radius. And he began to uh, work with the local uh, land conservation organization to um, create a proposition for the farmers. If they would reduce some of their uh, um, uh, what are, commodity crops, the feed corn, and they start to grow local vegetables and fruits, um, then they would be linked up with a local uh, community distribution. And so, uh, or organized a local food hub, which was channeling the local produce right to the supermarkets, which doesn't happen really anywhere in, in America. Um, and so that has created something of a green belt because the farmers who cooperated uh, became uh, land conservators. And they also learned new practices, agroforestry, permaculture. Um, and uh, then the last step here was for the students to train other youth in the town and unemployed students, uh, uh, unemployed persons, uh, to transform their agriculture. They looked at the soils and said, is it food or fiber we should grow here? How can we invest in local forestry? Um, re-emphasizing biodiversity around the city. So uh, this is just a summary of some of the accomplishments to date. As I said, it's one of the famous uh, Clinton 18 climate neutral, climate positive projects. 
Um, and these were the things that I tried to talk about. Um, I, as an exercise, a mental exercise for myself that I help, thought would also help illustrate this, I like to make diagrams that show relationships, processes, and as stakeholders understand where they fit in the larger scheme of things, they can understand the relationship of improvements to agriculture as producing a biogas, which can then perhaps go to uh, energizing the city uh, rather than coal, um, or the Green Arts District, which would really help uh, with economic development. Um, that everyone can become an agent or a participant in this process. So I put this up here, it's not as clear as I'd like it to be, but you could see uh, the relationship between the city of Oberlin and its college uh, in implementing these um, transformation, transformative uh, gestures for the town. And this is just an image of a very quick sketch I made last year when I was here in Kursig. Just based on conversations uh, and observations I made, I began to think of some of the local resources around Kursig. Uh, for example, the, the, the uh, uh, upland use of reservoirs to hold the water rather than to have erosion to create energy from that. Some of the land use improvements, some of the uh, health spa possibilities that would that bring revenue to, to Kursig. But how we use all of these technologies, innovative, renewable uh, energy, uh, together with potentially using some of the waste from the farms uh, to create a new carbon neutral energy stream. And so um, I leave you with, with that. And then as a conclusion, um, just to highlight the nature of the collaborative initiative, this partnership between uh, the academy, the town gown, we call it civic academic partnership um, and local government with some federal support, um, joining with corporate uh, sponsors and so on, and partnering with local enterprises. And here I put the local enterprises I think about in Kusik. So that's uh, basically what I wanted to talk about today, and I'll answer some questions. Uh, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Thank <laughs> you.